The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or to view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. So to finish up, so today, I want to finish up a couple of loose ends in the class. The first is I want to pick up, we're going to, by the end of the day, we'll talk about EPR that we've picked up on the last couple of lectures. We're going to close up Bell's theorem from the very beginning. So we talked about Bell's inequality. And we'll reprove Bell's inequality, and then we'll see what quantum mechanics has to say about it. Um, but first, I want to show you something neat. So a couple of times we've talked about entanglement and what it can do. Uh, and, and I want to spend the first good chunk of the class talking about what entanglement can do, and also what it can't. So before we get started, I want to remind you of a couple things from the last lecture. So the first is, we have, so particles can have spin, half integer intrinsic angular momentum that has nothing to do with being a rigid object that rotates, but is just some intrinsic property of angular momentum. And the spin is represented, it's observable, it's represented by an operator, in fact a vector of operators as x, x, y, and a c, that satisfy the same commutation relations as the orbital angular momentum. Now last time, one thing we showed is that a state which is up uh, or, for example, down uh, at an angle theta. So if I measure the spin along this axis, I will always find it's either up or down, spin 1 half, either plus h bar upon 2 or minus h bar upon 2. But I can express this state in terms of the states with spin which are up or down along the z axis. And we found, uh, uh, we, or we gave an expression, and I challenge you to, to follow the logic given to derive this expression, uh, an expression for the state which is in this case down along the angle theta. Uh, went down when measuring spin along the angle theta um, in terms of up and down along uh, 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 of spin um, along the z-axis or along the angle 0, theta here being the declination from the vertical. OK? Yeah? So that's the Yes. Is there a relative normal for the angle? Yes. Yeah, there's a, there's a general thing for this that says at, for a general angle, and it's actually in the notes. Um, which uh, I guess weren't posted from last time, but the, it's in the notes. Um, and it's also easy to derive, right? You just, you know what the, so the, what's the point here? The point is you have a spin vector, and it's a vector, S, X, S, Y, Z. And you can compute the, the operator representing spin along a particular direction by taking the unit vector in that direction and taking the dot product. So that gives you a particular linear combination of S, X, S, Y, and a Z. But from last time, you know that's just some stupid matrix. And you can express that matrix in any basis you want. For example, the basis of up and down in the Z direction, which is what we used last time. And then you can find the eigenvectors of that. And that's how you find these states. Yeah, so there's a very simple generalization. It just involves an extra angle theta, which is the angle around the equator. OK? So then, sorry, phi, extra angle phi. Um, so we then did the following thing. I talked about the stern girlash experiment. And here I'm going to abstract away from the stern girlash experiment the core of the nugget, the, the core of it. And the core of it is this. Suppose I have some, some, uh, some spin, and I put it in a particular state. Let's say, for simplicity, up in the z direction plus down in the z direction with equal amplitudes. So they're equally likely to be measured. And then, so these guys, these two states should be degenerate in energy because the system is rotationally invariant. It's just a spin sitting there. There's rotational invariance, so we know that the energy can't depend on the z component of the angular momentum. But we can break that symmetry and break the degeneracy by turning on a magnetic field. So for a stern girlish experiment, we turn on a magnetic field that had a gradient. But I just want to look at a constant magnetic field for the moment and see what it does. So we turn on a constant magnetic field. That's a contribution to the energy, which is minus the magnetic field dot the magnetic moment, which is a constant times the spin. But if the magnetic field is in the z direction, then this is just bz sz. So we then found yesterday that this led to a splitting that the up state had energy plus h bar omega, and the down state had energy minus h bar omega, where omega is given by mu naught bz upon 2. Yesterday, we had an additional term which involved the z dependence, the beta z term. But here, I'm just looking at a constant magnetic field. But if we know what the energies are, these are still the eigenstates of the energy operator. If we know what the energies are, we know how the system evolves in time. Here's the initial state. These are the eigenstates. The energies are these. So we can let the system evolve in time, and we find that all we do is we evolve the system with phases. This is as usual in quantum evolution. If you have an expansion of a state in energy eigenstates, time evolution is just phases for each term. But note that there's a simple thing. This omega, the thing that determines the rate of evolution of the phase, is controlled by the magnetic moment, which is something intrinsic to the spin, and the magnetic field, which is something I can dial in an experiment. I can really tune it. 
Meanwhile, I can decide how long to leave the magnetic field on. I could turn the magnetic field on for a while, and I could turn it off a while later. So suppose I'm, I leave the field on for a time t such that omega t is equal to pi upon 2. Okay? So I turn on a magnetic field for a time t such that omega t is pi upon 2, or t is equal to pi upon 2 omega. What is the state then afterwards? The state subsequently, psi after, is equal to, well, it's this guy with omega t uh, equal to pi upon 2. But what's e to the i pi upon 2? i, right? And e to the minus i pi over 2 is minus i. So this is an i and a minus i. I can pull out the i. So the phi after is i of phase upon root 2 times up z minus down z. Yeah? That's cool. And this is a state that we, st that we saw last time. It's actually up to a normalization, which is just an i, uh, up or down x, down in the x direction. Okay. So what this lets us do is something really quite cool. What this tells us, and I, all these calculations are just the stern girlish calculation, but even easier because we don't have a gradient. If we turn, if we have the spin uh, in some superposition, which incidentally was initially up and down in the z direction, this is equal to up in the x direction. And we turn on the magnet, so we have uh, in, 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 z, in x, we have it up. We turn on a magnetic field in z, and what happens is the spin precesses around the z axis, and we get down. Okay? We get precession. Here's the important point. The important point for everything that's going to follow is this. If I have some spin state, and I want to take it to some other spin state, how do I do so? Well, I can build a machine that does it by turning on the appropriate magnetic field and having the magnetic field precess the spin. Okay? Here, I found exactly what magnetic field I need to turn on with what amplitude and for how long, such that I take the state up x to down x with a known phase i. Everyone cool with that? So any unitary, so here's the thing I want to convince you of, any unitary operation that takes you from one vector to another vector, or sorry, from one spinner to another spinner, up z, down y, linear combination of up and down z, some particular linear combination of up and down x, any such pair of vectors can be related by unitary transformation. And any such unitary transformation can be built by some series of magnetic fields. Is that cool? Okay. And you can, just, you can prove this to yourself quite quickly, but let me just state it. Okay. So now this gives us the ability to do the following. One, um, we have, so what do we have here? We have, when we have spins, one, spins that can be put in a system that can be put in states like up, z, and down z, right? And two, the ability to, um, to rotate states, ability to evolve states uh, from state to state, from spin state one, psi one, to psi two, by turning on some magnetic fields. So by suitably tuning, choosing our magnetic fields. Everyone cool with that? So here's a question I want to ask. What do we do with this? Imagine we really had this equipment in front of us. What power, what awesomeness could we realize? And this is the entry point to quantum computing. Okay. The answer to what can you do with this cool machinery is you can build a quantum computer. So let's talk about what that means. So quick question, do quantum computers exist? Yeah, are, are they very big? No, OK, the biggest quantum computer that's been built, to my knowledge, is one that has factored the number 15, although they might have done 21 at this point. I'm not exactly sure. 21? Done? Yeah, OK, 21's done. Good. So that's, that's the upper end at the moment. Yeah. Well, they're, they're large physically. It's true. They take up a, a room, but, you know, or at least a large tabletop, an optics table. But, but they're not very big in a useful sense. OK, and there's actually interesting, reasonable people, not just reasonable, intelligent people, um, and reasonable. That's, that's a non-trivial. Okay, the, the people who live at the intersection of intelligent and reasonable. Okay, um, uh, uh, which admittedly, as as my colleague is pointing out, is, is not a large overlap. Um, the, uh, the there are people in that overlap who suspect uh, that it's for some fundamental reason impossible to build a useful quantum computer in some deep deep sense. I don't know whether that's true or not, but we're about to engage in a discussion of what happens when you build quantum computers for n bits where n gets large, like you know, millions and billions as you need for codes or for, for studying images. Um, 
And of course, it's a little strange because these computers, such a computer doesn't exist, which leads to uh, my colleague and friend Scott Aronson's uh, lovely comment that his job as a, someone who studies quantum computers is to prove things that can't be done with computers that don't exist, which is what we're about to do. So, so let's talk about quantum computing. So what do I mean by quantum computing? Here's the basic idea. Let's, let's talk about classical computing. Classical computing says, I have these things called bits, which are binary objects. They're either 0 or they're 1. And we realize them in a very particular way. We realize them with a little magnet, which you know, points north or south. Now, it's not always exactly a magnet. It isn't like an old style hard disk uh, in your computer. It's something a little more fancy than just a magnet. But, but it's still basically a magnet. And you have something north, south. And whether it's pointing north or whether it's pointing south down here, which I'll call 0, or whether it's pointing north uh, down here, uh, which I'll call a 1, uh, determines whether you call this 0 or 1. And compu classical computation is your data are a set of numbers, you know, what's pointing down. And uh, uh, the process of doing a classical computation is build a machine which is governed by uh, classical mechanics, okay, that takes this initial configuration and replaces it with a new one, f of 0, 1, which is also some number, so it's maybe it's 0, 0. I don't know, it's whatever f is. And what you want to do is you want to perform some calculation, which is some function, a known function, of your input variables, function in this case of two bits, which produces the output that you want. And you build a machine that does that. Okay? So let me give you an example. I want to build a, a, a classical computer that takes, uh, takes a, a string of, 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 in, of binary integers, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, um, and, uh, and d performs a logical knot on each bit independently. So I need to build that computer out of objects available to me. Okay? And they need to use nothing other than the laws of classical mechanics uh, that has to suffice to describe the system that I'm going to. So let me give you an example of such a computer. Why, Alan, why don't you do this calculation? OK, so that's the input. And I am now the classical computer, 0, 0, 1, 1. Right? Now, that's not actually what you do in your cell phone or on your laptop. That uses transistors, but it's the same basic idea. You build a set of machine, you build a set of, of uh, objects, you know, magnetic fields, electric currents that affect this calculation. And so there's some relationship between what electric fields you turn on, what currents you induce to flow, and the calculation you want to perform, f of the input. Okay? This is the basic idea of a classical computer. With a quantum computer, we want to, oh, and, and one last thing. Suppose we have n bits. Suppose we have n uh, classical bits. Um, then we have 0, 1, come to the n. And how many numbers do you have to specify to specify the configuration of n bits? This is sort of obvious. Well, no, you just need to specify the number of each bit, right? So we need n bits, right? So n binary numbers. Ever cool that? I specify what each register is, and I'm done. OK. Let's treat, imagine this is quantum mechanical. Let's now take, instead of having bits, let's take um, quantum mechanical bits, by which I'm going to mean bits. a system that has two possible observable states, 0 and 1. OK. So these are the possible observable states. Um, and um, to specify a general configuration, I say that psi is equal to, um, and I'm going to represent this by, uh, well, psi is equal to some linear combination, alpha 0 plus beta 1. Now, if I measure, we know that we'll find either 0 or 1. Right? If we measure the spin in the z direction, we will measure either up or down. However, at a given moment in time, the system needn't be in a state corresponding to a definite value of that. It could be in a general superposition. Agreed? So now here's the question. How, do you, how many numbers does it take to specify the state of a single quantum bit? Two complex numbers. right? It takes two complex numbers to specify the state of it. And if we have n qubits, then there are n of these guys, well, then how many numbers does it take? Well, I have to specify the state of every possible, uh, I have a, a possible superposition for every possible configuration of the system. So for example, it could be all 0, 0, 0, dot, 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 uh, 0, uh, plus beta, the first one is 1, and the rest are 0, dot, 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 plus. And how many terms are there? There are 2 to the n terms. Right? So how many numbers do I need to specify this? to the state of, of n qubits, I need 2 to the n complex numbers. Yeah? Everyone see that? So this immediately leads to a really frustrating reality we have to face. Suppose you want to simulate using a classical computer, such as sits on my desktop, 
I wanted to simulate a quantum mechanical system of n bits, or n spin 1 half states, evolving according to some energy function, evolving according to some uh, Hamiltonian. How many variables and how much memory will it take? Two to the n, right? If I've got n bits that I want to describe, it's going to take two to the n complex numbers. So that's how many variables I have. So if I have 10 bits, literally 10 little spin 1 half objects, to accurately specify the quantum configuration of the system, I need 2 to the 10 complex numbers. And that's for 10 spins. How many spins make up this piece of chalk? <laughs> right? So could you ever, in an honest way, simulate on a computer, on a classical computer like sits on my desktop, a quantum mechanical system the size of this chalk? Absolutely not. It's completely and utterly intractable. You have to come up with some sort of approximation scheme. So simulating quantum systems directly by just taking the spins and representing them with a wave function is wildly inefficient, incredibly difficult. Interestingly, the converse is almost certainly not so difficult. It's almost certainly possible for a quantum system to simulate classical evolution quite easily. And how do you know that? Here we are. Yeah, here we are, exactly. Mm -hmm. right? Nature apparently has no trouble simulating classical mechanics with underlying quantum mechanics. Quantum mechanics is the operating system, and classical mechanics is the simulation it's running. OK? Yeah, in a very, in a very useful sense, very real sense. So at this point, um, uh, Feynman, I think, was the first person who really pointed this out. And, but I don't, I don't know the details of the history, but the lore is that this was really Feynman's observation, that, look, if that's true, this opens up a real possibility for computation. If, cal if things like spins, you know, hard problems like calculating how spins evolve, or even the motion of chalk in the room, um, can be done pretty efficiently by nature. If we could build a computer that used quantum mechanical bits, whose variables were quantum mechanical and involved all the superpositions and interference effects of quantum mechanics, perhaps we could build computers that run exponentially faster and with exponentially less memory and less resources than a classical computer would. Because apparently it works, right? Because we're here, as was definitely said. So, this is the question of quantum computing. Can you use quantum mechanics? Can you use, in particular, the quantum evolution of a system to perform calculations that you'd care about rather than, uh, uh, rather than classical computation? And if you do so, do you gain anything? Do you get any sort of speed ups? Is there an enhancement? Is anything better? So here's the basic gig. The basic gig is that we're going to take our system, consider the following kinds of quantum systems. Our systems are going to be n qubits, or n spins. But because I, don't, I want to emphasize that the substrate doesn't matter, the underlying material doesn't matter, I'm going to refer to them purely, and this is totally typical in the field, as qubits rather than spin systems. And the reason is it might work to use little isolated you know, spinning particles with intrinsic spin. That might turn out to be technologically infeasible. It, it, it shouldn't matter at the end of the day in the same way that if I ask you, how does your computer work, or if I ask you to write a code, you write some code in C or Python or whatever, what the hip kids are using these. So you, you write some, you know, some little scheme code. I still love scheme. Um, you, you write some little scheme code, and it performs some calculation. It's defined in, in just logic, in, in lambda calculus, in abstract logic. Um, do you need to know the substrate? Do you need to know whether your transistors are built out of you know, silicon or germanium, or, or indeed whether it's running on vacuum tubes? No, that's the whole point of abstracting away computation, that the substrate doesn't matter. So we can use spin 1 half, and that's going to be useful for us at various moments. But I want to emphasize that the important thing is the actual logic of the process, not the underlying substrate. So here's what I need. My systems are going to be n copies, or n qubits, okay, where each bit is specified by either a 1 represented by up or 0 represented by down. I'll use these interchangeably. So that the, the full system, psi, is a superposition of sum over all possible, well, sorry, I won't even write that. So th this is my system. It's going to evolve according to some energy operation. And so my input is going to be some wave function, psi in, for these n qubits. Computation is going to be evolve with some energy operator, which I've chosen to implement an algorithm in the same way that the precise series of magnetic fields that we turn on in a classical computer, or currents that we allow to flow in a classical computer, implement the algorithm we want to affect. 
we evolve with some energy operator implementing our algorithm, we get some output wave function psi, again, for our n bits and quantum bits, out. Okay? So this is a basic gig with a quantum computation. We're just replacing strings of binary numbers and, funct and functions evolution according to classical mechanics in Maxwell uh, to other strings of numbers with superpositions of states, superpositions of strings, as it were, um, evolving according to the Schrodinger equation into, again, general superpositions. So how does this differ? What are the key differences from classical computer? So the key things are, first off, the input and output are not definite values. They could, in general, be superpositions. They do not have to correspond to a definite state in the 1, 0 basis. Right? These, in general, are superpositions of 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0. Okay? So the input and output are superpositions are superpositions of the values we'll measure. OK? Second, when we do measure, at the end of the day, the output, we get interference from the various different terms in the superposition. The different terms in the superposition will lead to interference effects. And so our output will be sensitive to that interference between the different terms in the superposition. Right? It may be that we're in some pure state, but it may be in general, more generally, we'll be in some superposition of the states we want to measure. So we're going to get interference. So um, naively, this is a disaster because this means we get probabilistic outcomes. That sounds bad. And so this leads to the, the key difference in, in quantum, or the key move in quantum computation. Given that we're going to have interference, and given that those interference effects are going, to lead, are, going to, um, uh, are going to affect the probabilities of various outcomes, what we're going to want is to tune or orchestrate the, the interference to get a definite outcome. We want to get the, right out, the, the correct answer out rather than just probably the correct answer out. Now, there's a slight variation of this. It's not obvious at the beginning how to do that. It's not even clear that you can. So I'm going to show you that you can. I'm going to show you an explicit algorithm that realizes this. But OK, that's obviously going to be tricky. Here's something else you can do. If you, if you can also focus on special problems. Focus on checkable problems. OK, and what I mean by this, imagine we have some algorithm that gives us an output, and that output is probably uh, the right answer, but we're not sure. There's some quantum mechanical probability that this is the correct answer to our computation. There's some probability that it's not. So if the calculation was difficult, but it's easy to check whether you have the right answer, then that's great. Imagine it's 10% you get the right answer, but it's trivial to, do, to check. So for example, factoring numbers. right? If you multiply the numbers, that's easy. You can check whether, to see whether you got the right thing. So for example, if, imagine I, I build a computer that uh, is supposed to factor numbers. I almost said factor prime numbers. That would be a boring computer. So imagine that we build a machine that factors numbers. right? And so imagine its output is probabilistic. So you say 15, and I say 3 times 5. You say 15, I say 5 times 3. You say 15, I say 7 times 2. At that point, you're like, well, which one is right? Well, you can check by multiplying. right? So if you have a problem which is easy to check but hard to do, then probabilistic is already OK. And that's just as true classically as it is quantum mechanically. Those are our basic moves. Okay? And so the key, thing, the key thing for us is that when we have n quantum bits, we have these interference effects. And in particular, as discussed as we started talking about last time, we get entanglement effects. And what we're going to discover is that the key to making a good quantum algorithm is going to be to attune the entanglement appropriately. So I'm going to have to define that for you in just a minute. Yeah? How do you know the fact that the checking is also probabilistic? Sorry? The checking process. Well, the check it may or may not be. So the, the check, for example, could be like, for example, imagine the, the process I just gave you. So the question is, how do you, what do you do if the checking process is probabilistic? But you can use a classical computer to check if you have an easy checking algorithm, for example, multiplying numbers together. Does that defeat the point of using a classical computer? No, because, good. And so the question then becomes, it doesn't that defeat the point of using a quantum computer if you're using a classical computer to check? And so here's the thing. If I ask you to factor a gigantic number, what do you have to do? Well, you have to take all numbers up to its square root, and you have to multiply them together, and that takes forever. Right? But if I tell you, do these two numbers multiply to give you a, a third number? That's easy. Right? So I use the quantum computer for the hard part and the classical computer for the forward part, for the checking. 
And that's a special class of problems which are checkable. These all have fancy names in information theory. I'm not going to use the fancy names. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. I mean that when we compute, so suppose I give you some output, and let's say the output is 0, 0 plus 1, 1, right? What are you going to get if you measure the first bit? Well, you're either going to get 0 or 1, with one probability or another, right? Um, when, we take, when, we, uh, when, we, um, when we compute the probabilities in general, when we have many terms in our superposition, we're going to get interference effects from different terms in the superposition. Right? And uh, those interference terms will tune the probability so they're not just the naive probability score, you know, the, the probability of that one thing, but you know, that you get these quantum interference terms. The norm squared of one, norm squared of two, and then the real part, twice the real part of the cross term. And that twice the real part of the cross term didn't exist classically, but quantum mechanically it's important and it can change the final probability. That's what I mean by the interference effects. Okay, so let's make all this much more explicit. So, so far I'm just giving you philosophy, and you should be deeply suspicious of philosophy in a physics classroom. So, again, to be explicit, a quantum bit, or qubit, is equal to a two-state system. And again, the substrate doesn't matter. I could be talking about spin one-half systems, or I could be talking about you know, ropes on a cylinder mod with winding mod two. I could be talking about all sorts of things, but it's, it's some system with two quantum states, uh, zero and one. I want to emphasize this is not going to be on the final. So this is, this is for your moral well-being. OK. So, so a quantum bit is a two-state system. We have these two states, which I'll call 0 and 1. And a general state, the general wave function, is psi is equal to alpha 0 plus beta 1. OK. And the probability, what this means is the probability that I measure 0 is equal to norm alpha squared, et cetera. Now, again, many systems can be used, many different substrates. This is what I'm going to mean by a qubit. So that's one qubit. The much more interesting system is two qubits. So let's study two qubits. Okay. So in the case of two qubits, what's a general state? Well, a general state is going to be, well, the first particle could be 0, and the second particle could also be 0. Or we could have the first particle 0 and the second particle 1 with some coefficient, plus beta, plus uh, gamma. Uh, uh, 1, 0, plus delta 0, 1. OK? So this is just a general superposition. Now, you might worry at this point, look, are these identical? Are these non-identical spins? Right? But here's the thing. I've got a spin here. It's in a box. I've got another spin here. It's in a box. I've got another qubit over here. It's in a box. So they're distinguishable because they're in different places in my laboratory. So these are distinguishable particles. Right? The particle in this box is either up or down. OK. So these are distinguishable. I don't have to worry about uh, symmetrization. Uh, bosonic or fermionic statistics or any of that. They're distinguishable. And we need normalization. So norm alpha squared plus dot 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 is equal to 1. And what does this mean? Well, what this means is that, for example, the probability that the first particle, which I'll call A, is equal to 0, is equal to, well, it's all, we sum over all the possible ways we could do that. We have norm alpha squared plus norm beta squared. But these guys are, whoops, um, uh, this was 1, 1. Thank you. Um, and, uh, and more to be, if we're more specific, the probability of the first uh, qubit is 0, and the second qubit uh, is 1, is equal to, well, I need 0, 1, that this guy is the norm beta squared. OK? What do I mean by two qubits? But this immediately leads to a funny thing. There are two kinds of states of, that, a, that a pair of qubits could be in. A very special set of states, which are called separable states. And these are special. And these states correspond to the full system being in the state where the first particle is in one state and the second particle is in the second state. Okay. So for example, um, this could be, e.g., uh, the state 1 over root 2 uh, up plus, uh, sorry, uh, yeah, uh, 0 plus 1 for the first particle, and the second particle to be in the state 1 over root 2, uh, 0, uh, minus 1. Oops. Is that the example I want to get? Oh, let's just call these general coefficients. Um, a plus b and times c plus d. Okay. So what is this equal to? Well, this is of the form. Well, there's going to be a term that's 0, 0, and that's 
uh, AC plus a term that's 0, 1, and that's AD with a minus, minus AD, uh, uh, plus a term that's uh, 1, 0, and that's BC, and plus a term, whoops, minus a term that's 1, 1, and that's um, BD. Okay? And this is clearly not generic, because it implies relationships amongst the alpha, beta, delta, and gamma, apart from just normalizability. Everyone see that? So it's a pretty non-trivial thing that you can write a thing as the first particle is in one state and the second particle is in the second state. And here's physically what that means. Physically what that means, oh, and well, actually, so physically what that means is that if you're in a state like this, and I ask you, what's the probability that I measure the first particle to be 0, do I need to know anything about the state of B? No. The relative, if I want to know what the probability of the first particle is 0, I just take norm A squared, because I'm going to get plus norm C squared plus norm D squared. And if I want to know whether the first particle is going to be B, OK, so that's fine. So imagine, so the probability of the first particle being up or down is independent of any information about the second particle, right? But there's another thing that's important. Suppose I tell you, aha, I've measured and the first particle is in the state 0. OK, cool. What is the state subsequent to that measurement? So if we measure a is equal to 0, what is the state subsequent? Psi is equal to, well, that's 0, and we know we've lost this. So this particle is now, this particular subsystem, this particular qubit has been collapsed to the state 0. So we have 0 times c0 minus d1 for the second particle. Have we learned anything about the state of the second particle? Have we learned anything about the state of the second particle? <laughs> Absolutely not. Right? Beforehand, what was the probability that the, part of the second particle was 0? Norm c squared. And the second particle 1? Norm d squared. Now what's the problem? Same, norm c squared, norm d squared. So when you have a separable system, measuring one qubit tells you nothing about the other qubit. Cool? On the other hand, consider a state which is not separable. So the generic state, generic states, are not separable. And let me give you an example of a state which is not separable. Which one do I want to pick? Yeah, what the hell? Um, psi is uh, 1 over root 2, uh, 0, 0, plus 1, 1. Okay. Can this be written as the product of the first particle in one state, the second particle in the other? No, because there would have to be cross terms which don't exist here. Right? Just compare this to that form. So we have that the coefficient of 0, 0 is AC, and, the, and both so A and C must both be non-zero. And the coefficient of 1, 1 is BD. So the coefficient BD must be, both of those be, must be non-zero. So AC and BD are all non-zero. That means these terms have to exist in order for it to be separable. Yeah? Because A and D can't vanish, and B and C can't vanish, and these are orthogonal states. They're independent. So this is not a separable state. We call these states entangled. And it's funny because uh, entangled ED. Yeah, I think there's an E in there. Um, OK, that's better. Um, uh, look, I'm not a professor of spelling. So, um, so we call these states, it's a little bit funny to, call these, to give these a special name and call them entangled because the generic state is entangled, right? It's sort of like calling mice uh, and uh, calling mice mice and calling all the other mammals non-mice, <laughs> right? Oh, look. Uh, well, that was a bad example. Oh, look, a mice ran across the room. So it, <laughs> um, <laughs> hearkening back to an earlier lecture. Um, so, uh, so but in any case, we give these a special name. And the reason we give them a special name is that these separable states do more or less what you expect classically. There are no strange correlations between the state of one and the state of the other. They're independent quantities. But when you have a generic state, there, something funny happens. They're entangled. And here's the funny thing that happens. Suppose, uh, given this state, what's the probability that I measure the first particle to be up or to be 0? 1 half. What's the probability that I measure the first particle to be 1? 1 half. Okay. So before doing any measurements, uh, uh, the first particle is equally likely to be either 0 or 1. But suppose I measure the second particle to be uh, up. Okay then the probability that I measure the first particle is 0 is equal to 0. And the probability that the, second, the first particle is 1 is equal to 1, because I've collapsed onto this term in the wave pack, in the wave function. 
So measuring the second qubit alters the probability distribution for the first qubit. These guys aren't independent. They are correlated in a way that you studied on the problem side. They are correlated. They're in a correlated state. We call this correlation entanglement. And here's the thing that's most spooky about this, and we'll come back to this in a few minutes. But I didn't tell you anything about the geometry of this setup. But in fact, when I was thinking of that measurement, I built the two little qubits in my lab, and then I took one and I sent it to France, and I took the other, because France, you know. Um, and I took the other one and I sent it to the planet Zorg, right? And so off on the planet Zorg is some poor experimentalist huddling in the cold. And, uh, and the, 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 our French experimentalist makes a measurement, altering the probability distribution instantaneously on Zorg. That should make you a little worried. That sounds a little crazy. We'll come back to why that is or isn't crazy. And, and, uh, and the EPR uh, analysis, which, which sort of puts flesh on it, sounds crazy uh, in a little bit. But for the moment, let me just emphasize that while the generic state is entangled, the generic state is also different than what your classical intuition would expect. There are correlations between the particles. So this is something that happens with quantum mechanical particles that doesn't happen with classical particles. And that means it's something that can be used in a quantum computer that can't be used in a classical computer. So let's see what using entanglement gives us for computation. So let's come back to the quantum co computing problem. And um, how do we compute with qubits? So how to compute? OK. So again, as usual, the way we take our input to our output is we build a machine that implements an algorithm of our choice by arranging the physical evolution of the system under time. So that means picking an electric field. Or sorry, an energy operator, an electric field. Good lord. Um, so it means picking an energy operator. Okay. So computing is Schrodinger evolution with a chosen, with our chosen, or our tuned energy operator. So for example, I want to build for you now a couple of basic circuit elements that you might want to use in a quantum computer. So example one. First example is I want to build a not gate. And what not means is it takes the state 0 and gives me 1, and it takes the state 1 and it gives me 0. Okay? This is what not does. So how do I build a not gate? Well, I can realize this uh, in, a, in a nice way. Um, uh, do, 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 do I want to say it that way? Yeah, good. So if I realize one, 0 as 1, 0, and 1 as 0, 1 from last lecture, then 1, 0, or, oh, sorry, 0, 1, 0, 1 to 1, 0. So we need an operator. We need time evolution to affect multiplication by an operator that takes this vector to this vector and this vector to this vector. But we know what that unitary operation is. That unitary operation, which I'll call not, must be equal to 0, 1, 1, 0. And this operation takes this guy to this guy, and it takes this guy to this guy. Yeah? But I can write this as, I like this, I can write this as, um, shoot, there's a phase, minus i, uh, e to the i pi uh, over 2, uh, 0, 1, 1, 0. I mean, you can't stop me, right? So this expanded out, as we've done, on, uh, as we've done before, expanding this out. Uh, gives me, with the exponential, 1 plus the thing and then all the other terms. This becomes minus i times cosine of pi over 2 times the identity, the 2 by 2 identity, uh, plus i sine of pi over 2 times 0, 1, 1, 0. Okay. But what's cosine of pi upon 2? Yeah, 0. I <laughs> Come on, because I'm that tired. So cosine pi over 2 is 0. It's up. Um, sine of pi upon 2 is 1. That gives us i times minus i. That's 1 times 0, 1, 1, 0. Pretty solid. But what is this? Well, this is the form. This is Schrodinger evolution with a magnetic field. And this is just the unitary uh, transformation, unitary transformation uh, for, uh, for um, a magnetic field. Well, OK, we can say this. This is um, the, the x poly matrix from last time. So this is like Sx unitary transformation for a magnetic field in the x direction for some time t, for a time t times the frequency omega, which is given by mu b upon 2, um, is equal to uh, pi upon 2. 
Okay? Just like before, but for a slightly different one. Slightly different magnetic field. So my point here is that we can, turn, we can pick a magnetic field that does this. We turn on a magnetic field for a, with a known amplitude with a known amount of time. Doesn't, details here don't matter so much. The point is we can do it. We turn on a magnetic field in the x direction, and it takes 0 to 1 and 1 to 0. Everyone cool with that? So here is a substrate, an actual physical system that affects this particular evolution. I can build a knot. The crucial thing is I can build a knot gate. And I'll, call, I'll represent that knot with some unitary transformation, uh, u sub knot. So that's a useful one, but it's not the most useful game because our uh, gate. If you only ever uh, impose logical knots, you just get everyone angry, but you don't actually get anything done. So second example, uh, let that be a lesson to you, Congress. So the second example, uh, if we turn on the magnetic field in the y direction for a time t, for a particular time t, what we find is that 0 goes to 1 over root 2, 0 plus 1. Okay? And 1 goes to 1 over upon root 2, uh, 0 minus 1. Okay? And this should be familiar. This is the up x state, and this is the down x state, just as we talked about before. So we turn on some B field and we get this. So this, it, this operation is called, it has a name because it's going to turn out to be very useful for us. It's taking a system that's definitely in the state 0, for sure, right? and it puts us in a superposition of 0, 1. It's a definite superposition, so it's not like we don't know what happened, but it's a superposition and, and you've lost certainty that you'll measure up in the z direction. You've gained certainty that you'll measure up in the x direction. But if we do all our measurements in z, we've just taken ourselves from definite to superposition. Cool? So that's useful because we know that something a quantum computer that it can do that a classical co computer can't do, something a quantum computer can take advantage of that a classical computer can't take advantage of, is this process of putting things in superpositions. So here we've got an operation that puts things in superpositions, and I'll call this Hadamard. And I don't know the history of why that's called Hadamard, but presumably there's some guy with the last name Hadamard. Anyway, the U Hadamard does this. And as a matrix, it's represented as 1 over root 2 times 1, 1, 1 minus 1. And there's a last one which is going to be useful for me, which is called, uh, t which is, uh, oh, and this is represented in the following way. Um, well, let me not worry about that. Another one is called C naught, controlled knot. Controlled knot does a really cool thing. It takes 0, 0, and 0, 1, and 1, 0, and 1, 1. What it does is it says, I'm going to apply a knot to the second qubit if and only if the first qubit is a 1. So this takes me to 0, 0 goes to. Well, do I perform a knot on this bit? No. So 0, 0. Do I perform a knot on this bit? No. 0, 1. Now I do perform a knot on 0, so I get 1, 1. And 1, 1, I perform a knot on this bit, which gives me 1, 0. OK? So this is called a controlled knot. It's a very useful thing. And I'm going uh, to represent this in the following way. Um, oh, sorry. I should represent all of these. So this knot gate, first, I take some initial bit. And it's in some state, and, it and then I uh, impose u naught, and it gives me an out state. Similarly, with the Hadamard, I take an initial state in, and I apply u Hadamard, and I get um, u out. And for controlled knot, I now have two qubits, and uh, I take the two qubits, and I do a controlled knot, which is represented in this form, which says do a knot on this guy controlled by this first bit. Okay? And so this acts as u c naught. Okay? And the key thing here is that while it's always possible to find a physical real representation of some particular unitary transformation, at the end of the day, all we're going to need is some truth table. At the end of the day, all we need is the logic that's being affected. And so the details of the substrate can be abstracted away. Okay. So what can we do with this? Oops. Right. So what, what can we do? Before we actually talk about what we can do with it, let's briefly talk about what you can't do with it. So what are things you can't do with these sorts of operations? What can't you do? And to me, this is among the more surprising. So here's a really surprising thing. Remember that. What we're doing here is going to be evolving a system forward with Schrodinger evolution. And Schrodinger evolution 
is linear. It respects superpositions. It's unitary. It preserves probability. Um, and it's, well, let's just focus on that. It's linear, unitary. It has lots of other properties, time reversal invariant, um, unless you turn on a magnetic field, which we do. But in particular, it's linear and unitary. And those facts are going to constrain powerfully the kinds of operations we can effect on a quantum system. So in particular, when we look at just two qubits, there's a beautiful, beautiful theorem that says there's no cloning. And here's what that means. The no cloning theorem, which is pretty highfalutin for what it really is, says the following. Suppose we have a, a system which is input x, y. And I want to build a machine that says, look, I've got this first qubit in the state x. And what I want to do is I make, want to make a copy. I want to make another quantum system that's in exactly the same state as x, whatever x is. So you hand me a system where the first bit's in state, Q, in state x, the second qubit's in state y. And I want to make a copy of x. And y is just the, I mean, just who cares what's in it? OK? So I want this to go to x, x, OK, for all y. So regardless of what, what data was in here, I want to overwrite that data and rewrite it, or that datum, and rewrite it with x. Can you do this? No, right. Why? It, excellent. It would violate linearity and also unitarity, indeed. So to see that quickly, so it's easiest to see the unitary, I think. Well, it violates them both. But for unitarity, imagine you take a linear combination of these guys that are where the two states, y, are orthogonal. And you take the norm squared, so you normalize it to 1. That linear combination, each one goes to xx but where the coefficient is the sum of those two terms. So we have, uh, for example, x, z, uh, alpha x, z plus beta x, y goes to alpha plus beta x, x. Yeah? And that's really bad, because if these, if x, z, and y are orthogonal, then the normalization is alpha squared plus beta squared is 1. But x, x, the normalization is alpha plus beta quantity squared is 1. And in general, that's not true. In fact, this could be 0. So this violates linearity and unitarity rather badly. So you can't clone. This is really disturbing. That means if you have a, if you have a quantum state and you, and you want to make a copy of it, you can't. You can't ever make a copy of your quantum system. One copy, one chance, that's it. No cut and paste. So as you can imagine, that pretty powerfully constrains things you can do. So a, a related thing here is that there's no forgetting. Quantum evolution is, uh, unlike an elephant, it is highly, uh, uh, it has a very, uh, uh, well, it's like an elephant, I guess. It, it remembers very well. It never forgets anything. Um, uh, and you can see that from this. This would be an example of forgetting. You forgot what was in the state y. You can't ever do that. Okay. So I leave this as a challenge to you to prove this. Show. It's a simple extension of the same logic. Okay. So what can you do? What you can do is you can entangle two qubits. And that's really the juice of everything. You can, whoops, you can entangle. So let me show you entanglement. Good, no E. Um, is there a question? No, OK, good. Um, so you can entangle, and here's how you do it. Let's take the state 0, 0. So we have two qubits. The first one's in the state 0, and the second one's in the state 0. And now I'm going to do the following set of operations to it. I'm first going to impose a Hadamard operation on the first qubit, and nothing on the second. And then I'm going to uh, apply a controlled knot. Okay. And I'm going to see what I get out. So the initial state is 0, 0. Right. I'll write this as 0, 0. After I had a MARD, the state is, well, the first bit is no longer in 0. Had a MARD on 0 gives me 0 plus 1. So this is now the state 1 upon root 2, 0 plus 1 times 1. Or, sorry, times 0, okay. also known as 1 over root 2, 0, 0, plus 1, 0. Now, is this a separable state? Yes, there it is separated. Okay. And now I'm going to perform a controlled knot. And what the controlled knot does is it switches the second bit if the first bit is a 1. So what is the state after we've done this? The state after we've done this is, well, from the first term, 1 upon root 2, from the first term, 0, 0, what, what happens to that when we control not? Well, we not this if this is 1. This is not 1, so we don't not it. We leave it alone. From the second term, 1, 0, plus 
Well, we, we flip this if this is 1 and not if it's not. This is 1. We flip it. We get 1, 1. And now this is the prototypical entangled state um, that I think I just erased. <laughs> but this is our entangled state. It's not separable. Right? If I measure the first one, I know what the state of the second one is, which is to say it's entangled. Cool? So by performing this series of operations, which is nothing other than a series of magnetic fields, which I'm going to impose to the system, I've taken a state with initial condition 0, 0 and, and put it into an entangled state, 0, 0 plus 1, 1. Cool? And that's all we need for the first basic algorithm of quantum computation. So this idea that quantum computers might be able to do things faster than classical uh, computers uh, floated around for a while. It took a while for people to, to make that sharp. And uh, David Deutsch, who is a, a very entertaining and bombastic uh, speaker, and he, write, he wrote, a, a, I guess, a, several now uh, pretty entertaining books um, on the topic. And he sounds crazy. You listen to the guy talk, and he sounds nuts. He sounds like, you know, he, he's way, he's just way out there. The thing, he's, he's just. Ah, you know, as a theorist, you, you listen to him, and you're like, go, just slow down there, buddy. Right? And um, so for a long time, I thought the guy, you know, because I only knew his sort of public persona, I thought, you know, he's a little bit crazy. I'm not exactly sure. And this is why everyone thinks he's such a damn genius, because this is beautiful. So here's, I don't know how he came up with this, but he's clever. So here is what's now called the Deutsch, and it's really the one part or one bit version of the Deutsch, um, T U T S C H, Joza algorithm. So there was a first an algorithm by Deutsch. It wasn't, didn't quite do what it was supposed to do. Then it was improved together with Joza, and they made an n-particle version, and then everything was awesome. But here's the Deutsch-Joza algorithm. Okay. And what it is, it's a series of rules for how to make a, a quantum mechanical system evolve so as to affect the calculation you wanted to, to, to calculate. So you have to grant, to begin, you have to let me pose a problem to solve that can be solved in this fashion. And this problem is going to sound a little contrived. And in fact, it's wildly contrived. It was contrived so it could be solved in this fashion. But it, it's actually uh, it, it's one that, that, it's one that pre-exists uh, the algorithm itself. So it's not quite as ridiculous. So here's the problem. So the statement of the problem is that someone has a function f of x. So uh, l let's say uh, Matt knows a function f of x. Okay. <laughs> now, the thing is, um, it's extremely expensive to evaluate this function f of x. Right? So the way you evaluate it involves putting, quantum, putting 20 kilomirrors in superposition states with each other. You have to run a whole experiment. And it costs uh, a lot of money to run. So he charges, but he charges. $1 million in order to, uh, <laughs> thank you. You guys are not quite old enough. So, um, so he, he knows the function of x. He charges a $1 million in order to evaluate the function. You say, hey, Matt, well, look, I know this is a function, which I should tell you. Um, f is, uh, is a function uh, that takes a single bit, 0 or 1, to another single bit, 0 or 1. So it sounds like, how hard could this possibly be? But in fact, it's a very hard function to evaluate. So you say, hey, Matt, what's f of 0? And he's like, give me a million bucks. And you give him a million bucks, and he's like, 1. You're like, damn, that costs a lot of money. So, <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, and now here's the question. So, this is not yet the problem. The, the problem is this: Is f of zero equal to f of one, or not? Okay. Is f of zero? So, f of zero is either zero or one. F of one is either zero or one. Are they equal to each other? So this is easy, right? Classically, this is stupid. You calculate the function f twice. You evaluate f of 0, and you get a number. You evaluate f of 1, you get a number. You look at your piece of paper. You say it's either the same or different, right? How much does that cost you? Two million bucks. Better have good funding. So this is an expensive. And here's what Deutsch and Joza have to say. And this is really Deutsch uh, at, at the beginning. It's all it's really quite spectacular. Deutsch says, actually, I tell you what, um, give me a million and a half. Uh, and I'll do the computation and give you the answer. At which point you think, like I did previously, the guy's clearly raving. But um, in fact, he's going to make a profit. And here's how he's going to do it. He's going to build not a classical computer, but a quantum computer 
using quantum interference and entanglement to do this calculation with one evaluation. And here's how it's going to work. And the first thing we have to do is uh, uh, a preview, or uh, sorry, setup. In order to do this calculation, uh, you need two things. First off, you need, to be, you need uh, Matt to be able to, build, to, to evaluate his function in a way that respects quantum mechanics. Okay? So in particular, Matt had better be able to do his experiment if I give him an, a superposition. So he'd better be able to affect the calculation in a quantum mechanical way, the same way that we implemented a not quantum mechanically, or the controlled not quantum mechanically, or the Hadamard, with some set of magnetic fields. He must be able to implement it quantum mechanically. Otherwise, it's not an interesting function. And let me just point out that any function you can think of can be implemented quantum mechanically because you are quantum mechanics. Okay? You're just not elegant implementation, no offense. You're just not an elegant implementation of the quantum mechanical uh, uh, computation. So what I want, so setup is Matt needs to be able to give me, Matt provides a unitary transformation, a unitary operation, u sub f, that takes two qubits, x and y, okay, to x and f of x plus y. Where what this means, f of x plus y, is plus is addition mod, mod 2. So what this says is if y is 0, then this gives me f of x plus 0. If f of x is 0, that's 0 plus 0. So that gives me 0. If f of x is 1, this gives me zero, 1 plus 0. That's 1. On the other hand, if y, or sorry, if y is 1, then this gives me, if f of x is 0, this gives me 1 plus 1, which is 0. And if f of x is 0, this gives me 0 plus 1, which is 1. Everyone cool with that? OK. Yeah. You mean what if quantum mechanics is only an approximate description of the? No, I'm sorry. No, sorry. Like, um, what if quantum mechanics, like the inelegant um, implementation of quantum mechanics, is inescapable? Is just an approximation of the real problem, or just a really, really good problem? Yeah, this is an interesting question. So, it, so it's tempting to think that this is a philosophical question, but it, it turns out not to be in a way that will be made sharp in about ten minutes with Bell's inequality. But. Um, a, a, a good answer, a complete answer to that question remains uh, open, and I think it probably always will. But let me rephrase the question slightly and tell me if this is an accurate statement. Um, look, um, at the end of the day, uh, what we're doing is we're going to develop a model where quantum mechanical calculation does something in particular. And that may or may not be a good model of the real world. And in particular, whatever the actual thing, the actual system that we're setting does, may or may not be well described by um, by that quantum mechanical model. Um, so can we check whether or not it, you know, it is? And I, I, is that more or less the question? Yeah, I, I'm, it's, a, it's a hard thing to make. So the problem is, all we can ever do is say that our model is a good model or a bad model. On the other hand, we can do the following. And this is the really neat thing. You might say, look, underlying quantum mechanics is going to be something more fundamental that's going to lead to slightly different results in exactly the sort of situations where we're going to care about quantum computation with large numbers of bits. Um, and if you tell me just a little bit, tiny, a little tiny bit about what properties that underlying description will have, that becomes an empirical question. So for example, if you say, look, I suspect that underlying the quantum mechanical probabilities is some classical probability distribution over a hidden variable that you have not actually measured. And what we're going to find out is that we can rule that out experimentally. Just that extra little assumption that there's an underlying hidden variable, a secret probability distribution on some variable that we just haven't observed yet. That is enough information about the, the system to rule out that model amazingly. So uh, I think we'll never have a full answer to your question. Um, but it, 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 all we can do is work and see uh, how well our model fits. And so far, nothing has ever disagreed with the quantum mechanical description. Um, let me hold off on questions just now, because I want to. Um, but it, it's a good and interesting question that's a hard one to deal with. Um, uh, by which I mean it's an open question. So Matt provides for us uh, an operator that allows us to calculate f of x. Now, remind, remember, you might have said, well, look, why not just take x? And why not have Matt build a machine that takes x and gives you f of x? Could you have done that? No well, it's not exactly no cloning. But let me leave this to you as a, a fun thing to think about. Why, are we, why do we need this carrier bit as well? 
OK. So there's our setup. Matt provides this function for us, you. And here's the algorithm. So the algorithm. And it's a series of steps. One by one, we do them. We perform these operations on our, on our qubit. Um, so here's what Deutsch, Deutsch says. Deutsch says start input a state psi is equal to 0, 1. First qubit is 0 in the state 0. The second qubit is in the state 1 for sure. We implement that with our boxes or however we want to implement it. So we find ourselves in a definite state, you know, hard, soft. So we take a hard box and we take a soft box and we pull out the hard one and the soft one. Okay. One. Had them already each. Had them on, on both bits. Both bits. Okay. So what does this take us to? It takes us to psi uh, is equal to, well, the 0 goes to 1 over root 2 times uh, 0 plus 1. Did I erase Hadamard? No, good. Uh, there's Hadamard. Um, so it does this, it does this. So it takes uh, the first one to 0 plus 1, and it takes the second one to 1 over root 2, uh, 0 minus 1. Cool? So at this point, this isn't very interesting. All we've done is we've taken it from one superposition to a different superposition. And it doesn't seem to have anything to do with f. In fact, we haven't measured f. Two, apply f. So we apply our operation u, u sub f. And this takes us to, ah, well, this is a sort of entertaining one. Um, if we take this 1 of root 2, uh, so I'm going to rewrite this um, in, in a slightly simple form. This is 1 half uh, 0 times uh, 0 times 0 minus 1 minus 1 plus 1 times 0 minus 1. Okay. And the reason I'm doing that is that we're going to apply uf, and uf, our function f, uses that first bit as um, a control bit for the second. So here's the control bit for the second. So we apply uf. And um, this gives us 1 half. I'm going to actually do this on the next board, because it's going to be gigantic. OK. So this gives us 1 half, 0. For, so that first one, this is going to take this and give it 0 plus f of 0 and 1 plus f of 0. So times uh, f of 0 uh, plus 0 minus f of 0 times uh, plus 1 plus, for the 1, uh, this is going to be times uh, f, of z f of 1 now plus 0 minus f of 1 plus 1. Okay. Now here's a cru crucial step. This is equal to, and I want to note the following. Look at, look at this particular guy. Okay. So for that particular guy, suppose f of 0 is 1, or sorry, is 0. If f of 0 is 0, then this is 0 plus 0, which is 0. So f, uh, equal f of 0 is equal to 0. Then this gives me 0, and this gives me 0 plus 1, which is 1, 0 minus 1. On the other hand, if f of 0, is equal to 1, then we get 1 plus 0, which is 1. And here we get 1 plus 1, which is 0, minus 0, which is equal to minus uh, 0 minus 1. Yeah? So I can write this as minus 1 to the f of 0 times 0 minus 1. Very cool then. This is just a little exercise in binary arithmetic. So I can write this first term. This is 1 half minus 1 to the f of 0. 0 times um, 0 minus 1. So that's from the first one. And exactly the same logic is going to apply to the second, but now f of 1 instead of f of 0. So plus minus 1 
the f of 1 times 1 times 0 minus 1. Okay. Now I want to point something out to you. If f of 0 is equal to f of 1, then what's true of f of 0 plus f of 1? Well, if they're the same, exactly, then either it's 0 plus 0, in which case we get 0, or it's 1 plus 1, in which case we get 0. So this is 0 if it's the same, and 1 if it's not. Okay? So we could either know them both, or we could measure f of 0 plus f of 1. So notice what happens here. This is equal to 1 half. And now I'm just going to pull out a factor of f of 0, minus 1 to the f of 0 times, well, both of these terms have a 0 minus 1 on the second bit. So the second qubit is in the state 0 minus 1. Right? Everyone cool with that? So this is equal to, for the first qubit, 0 plus 1 times minus 1 to the f of 0. But I've pulled out to square it plus f of 1. 1 times 0 minus 1. And here's the quantity we wanted to measure. If this is 0, then they're even. Then they're the same. And if it's, um, if it's 1, then they're not the same. So now at this point, we just forget 3, forget about the second qubit. Oh, Lord. Forget about the second qubit, and we get this state so forget about the second qubit, just does this. Just focus on this guy. And now if f is 0 plus f of 1 is 1, or sorry, is 0, so that they're the same, this is 0. Minus 1 to the 0 is 0, so we get 0 plus 1. So same, then our state is 0 plus 1. And if they're different, then we get the state 0 plus, or sorry, 0 minus 1. Everyone agree with that? So if they're the same, we get 0 plus 1. We get different, we get 0 minus 1. It still doesn't work for us, because if we measure, what's the probability we get 0 here? 1 half. And probability we get 1 is 1 half. It's similar if we measure here, 0, 1 half, 1, 1 half. On the other hand, these states are familiar to us, because they're what you get by Hadamarding. So why don't we take these from these states to these by doing the inverse of the Hadamard, which it turns out is Hadamard itself. So 4. Hadamard the first bit, had the first bit, and we get the output is uh, the state psi out is equal to 1 half, 1 plus minus 1 to the uh, f0 plus f1, 0, uh, plus 1 half, 1 minus minus 1 to the f0 plus f1, 1. And now, if f0, plus, if f0 and f1 are the same, this is a 0. We get 1 plus 1. And we get just 0. And this is 0. Because this is 1, this is 1. They subtract, we get 0. If they're the same, you get this state 0, properly normalized. If they're not the same, you get this state 1, properly normalized. Now, if we measure, if we measure 0, we know they're the same. And if we measure 1, we know they're different. And so with absolute certainty, now, 5, measure the first qubit. And we get 0 implies the same, and 1 implies different. And we did all of this with a single evaluation of our function f right here. Right? This is where we applied our function evaluation. We've applied the function evaluation once, and we deterministically get the result, whether they're the same or different. So with one call to Matt, to my oracle, with one call to Matt, which cost me $1 million, we get the answer to whether it's the same or different. And that's a factor of two faster than the best classical algorithm. But that's not so satisfying. This was supposed to be exponentially better. And so that's where Joza comes in. And together with Deutsch, Deutsch and Joza show the following that there's an exactly analogous problem 
for n qubits, wow, there's an exactly analogous problem for n qubits. Deutsch chose a problem. OK. And now, how many, different, how many different strings of integers could you put in? There are now two to the n possible states. And if you want to know whether f is the same for all of them, the worst case scenario is you measure that you evaluate f on the first possible combination, 0, 0, 0, 0, and you get some number. You measure f on 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, and you get the same number. And you just keep doing that forever. And you still don't know if they're all the same until you get to the very last one. Right? So it's 2 to the n. It's order 2 to the n is the worst case scenario. But typical scales are of order 2 to the n. So classically, it takes an enormous number whoops, of observations. But the quantum deutsch joza algorithm, sorry, that was n bit deutsch joza and now the n qubit deutsch joza problem, one quantum operation. And you get a deterministic result. And all of this, one, right? You evaluate it once, and you know you've solved the problem. So instead of 2 to the n operations, it takes a single one. And now for a large number n of bits, for example, for large integers dealing with very large numbers, uh, this is dramatically exponentially more efficient than the classical algorithm. So this is the basic. At this point, you know, people start really seriously thinking about quantum computation and whether you could get it to work and um, you know, how, much, how much juice you could get out of actually building such a quantum computer. And this has developed into a whole theory in, in the theory of computation, whole field of the theory of computation. Um, the thing I want to emphasize is that the crucial move is observing that in quantum mechanics you can entangle degrees of freedom. The crucial move is observing that you can entangle degrees of freedom quantum mechanically. And that's what gave us all of the nice effects. We have these interference effects. And these interference effects lead to the deterministic outcome being correlated with the result of the computation. It's, the interference is, a fit, is crucial. And this brings us to the last, to the last point, which is exactly what's so troubling about entanglement. And so here is where E.V. Arkeman and Einstein, Podolsky, and Rosen say the following. They say, look, there are two things that are deeply upsetting about this entanglement story. The first, and let me just give you a, preci a precise experiment, they say. They say, let me give you a precise experiment that embodies all the weirdness of this. Suppose I take two of these qubits, and I put the first one in this, uh, and I put the two qubits in an entangled state, up, up, plus down, down. OK? And let's normalize this with a 1 upon root 2. So there's our state. And then we take the first qubit, so there's our two bits, and we take the first qubit and we send it some far away. And someone named Alice is sitting here and is holding onto that bit. And we take the second bit and we take it far away. And someone named Bob, conventionally, is sitting here and holds the second bit. Now, given this initial configuration, what is the probability that Alice will measure the spin to be up? Her spin to be up. Half, right, and then half down. Similarly, Bob half up and down. Once Alice has measured the state to be up, right, immediately she knows something about Bob's spin. Bob's state will be up, because I chose this one. I could have chosen the other one, which is the more popular EPR pair. So, it's, so Bob's will also be up. Any, now, if you look at the list, if you do this over and over and over again, their list is just some random list of ups and downs, ups and downs. But they're exactly correlated amongst each other. So at this point, EPR are really upset because they say, look, there are two possibilities. Either there was an answer to the question all the way along of whether uh, Alice's was up and Bob's was up, or Alice's was down and Bob's was down, or there is some deep non-locality in, in the universe such that a distant measurement, causally disconnected, can, uh, can, be, uh, can have an influence on Bob's states such that they're correlated. This may seem random, but it's certainly not random because it's correlated with Alice, even though Alice is wildly disconnected, distant, distant, distant observer. Nothing could have traveled across that time, in, you know, across that distance in the time it took uh, to do the measurement. So there are sort of three responses you could take to this. The first response is, look, uh, there, there isn't a problem here. It's just saying that quantum mechanics is insufficient. There really, there's, secretly, there's a hidden variable, a, a variable you haven't observed yet, a property of an electron that determines whether it's going to be up or down early on. And the fact that it looks probabilistic just means that there's some classical dynamics for this hidden variable that effectively is, is probabilistic, like a particle moving in a fluid, like dust pollen grains in, in a fluid. It just moves around randomly. So, but it just looks random. It's not actually random. And it, it's, that's because there's an underlying classical mechanism controlling the probability distribution. 
The second version is a quantum mechanical version. The, the second interpretation is to say, look, this may look upsetting, and I grant you that it looks upsetting, but I'm a quantum mechanic, and quantum mechanics works like a champ, and I'm not about to throw it out and say that there's some secret hidden variables. Um, it just works. So just give up on your naive notions of locality, let it go, and just do the quantum mechanical calculation. Practicing physicists look at this and just yawn, right? If, if you're a practicing physicist, you just forget it. Like, obviously it works, so there's no more conversation to be had. So, um, so meanwhile, there's a second version of this, which is slightly more disturbing. Suppose Alice measures up, and this is all in the z direction. Suppose Alice measures up in the z direction. She thus knows that Bob's particle is up in the z direction. But simultaneously, Bob could measure spin in the x direction and determine that his spin is up in the x direction as well. At that point, EPR say, look, we've measured empirically, we've measured that the particle is both up in the z direction and up in the x direction. It's just that we, measured, we did that measurement using entanglement. But at the beginning of the day, at the very beginning, oh, shoot, I erased it. Dang, that's not what I wanted. So at the very beginning of the day, we had that Sx and X, uh, Sz uh, don't commute. So you can't have a state with definite Sx and definite Sz. You cannot possibly. It doesn't mean anything to say so. Einstein wants to say that this is because quantum mechanics is great but incomplete. The rest of us want to say that, no, it's not. But that sounds like a, pre that sounds like, um, you know, that sounds like a philosophical question. And that's the way it was treated for a very long time until you come along to Bell. And Bell made a beautiful observation. Bell said, look, telling me that there's an underlying classical description, telling me that there's an underlying probabilistic classical description tells me enough to make this an empirical question. Because it's saying that the, the statistics, the random statistics for Bob and Alice are correlated uh, by a classical dynamics rather than independent. So here's Bell's version. So remember at the very beginning, we talked about Bell's experiment. We said, consider three binary properties, A, B, and C. The number that are, uh, of some set that are A and not B plus the number that are B but not C is always greater than or equal to the number that are A but not C. And the way we proved this was just by noting that if these are classical deterministic binary properties, then A not B means A not B and C, or A not B and not C. And ditto for each of these other guys. And we ended up with an expression which was number that are A, so using that logic leads to number that are A not B and C, plus the number that are not A, B, and not C is greater than or equal to 0. And that's clearly true. You can't have a number of elements be negative. So this is trivially true, quantum mechanically. But now here's the experiment I want to do. I want to do actually the EPR experiment. And here's the experiment I want to run. Alice is going to measure up or down at 0. And Bob is going to measure up or down at theta. Alice is then going to measure up and down at theta. And Bob is going to measure up and down at 2 theta. And the third experiment is going to be Alice is going to measure up and down at 0. And Bob is going to measure up and down at 2 theta. So A is up or down at um, up at 0. B is up at theta. Um, B is up at theta. And or, sorry, this is going to be down at theta, not B is down at theta. B is going to be up at theta. And C is going to be down at 2 theta. And A, again, up at 0. And not C is down at 2 theta. Okay. So we can rephrase this as the probability that given that we are um, up at 0, what is the probability that we are subsequently down at theta? Plus the probability that we are up at theta. At, uh, what is the probability that we are up at theta and subsequently down at, at 2 theta? And then the probability that we are up at 0 and down at 2 theta using an EPR measurement, where one is performed by Alice and the other is performed by Bob, exactly as EPR wanted. And we computed this last time. In fact, I just erased, because I'm well, excited about this, I guess. I just erased the wave function that we needed, the state we needed. And the state that we needed was that if we are down at the angle theta, then this is equal to cosine of theta upon 2 uh, down at 0 plus uh, i sine uh, theta upon 2 up at 0. And this is enough to answer our question. This is the quantum mechanical prediction. What's the probability that given that we're down at the angle theta, we're up at the angle 0? Well, if we're down at theta, the probability that we're up at 0, the coefficient is i sine theta upon 2, and the probability is the norm squared of that expansion coefficient. So the probability is sine squared of theta upon 2. 
Similarly, the probability that we're up at theta and down at 2 theta, well, by a rotation by theta, this gives me exactly the same thing. So it's again going to be sine squared, sine squared, theta upon 2. The probability that we're up at 0 and down at 2 theta, well, we're just sticking a factor of 2 for theta everywhere. And that gives me sine squared of theta. Now I ask you, is the left-hand side always greater than or equal to the right-hand side? And this is easy to check. Let's do this for very small theta. For very small theta, theta sine squared theta, so for small theta, much less than 1, sine theta squared is theta upon 2, the angle, squared, which is equal to theta squared upon 4. And the next one is the same thing, plus theta upon 2 squared, which is equal to theta squared upon 4, theta squared upon 4, so theta squared upon 2. And the right-hand side is sine squared theta, which is theta squared. And is theta squared upon 2 greater than or equal to theta? Certainly not. So quantum mechanics predicts that if we do the EPR experiment using these observables repeatedly and build up statistics, what we will find is an explicit violation of the Bell inequality. And what that would represent, if it were actually true, if we actually observed it, would be a conclusive empirical proof that there are no classical definite configurations underlying the probability of quantum mechanical events. It would say that it's impossible to build a classical theory with hidden variables that are randomly distributed such that you reproduce the predictions of quantum mechanics. We see already that it doesn't agree with, classical or with quantum mechanics. The question is, does it agree with the real world? So someone has to build this experiment and check. And this was done by Alain Aspey. And it violates Bell's inequality. There is no classical description underlying quantum mechanics. The universe around you is inescapably probabilistic. It evolves in a deterministic fashion through Schrodinger evolution. But when we measure things, we measure results with probabilities. And those probabilities cannot be explained through some underlying classical dynamics. If there's something else underlying quantum mechanics, whatever else we know about it is it is not classical. And this property of probabilistic evolution or probabilistic measurement is an inescapable, empirically verified property of the reality around us. And that's quantum mechanics. Thanks, guys. <laughs>